the podcast hey, hey. for philosophers, seekers, and the generally curious. Uh, I'm Tim Newton. I'm Matt Parker. And I'm Jason Reed. And over there behind the scenes we have Laurel Parker, who is uh, standing in for Gavin News Pauly tonight. Yeah, poor Gavin. Saying, Paulie. Oh, oh, poor Gavin. Well, luckily, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he isn't really. It's not real, <laughs> that's <laughs> right. Yeah. Because what are we discussing today on Thinkative? Uh, we discussed. Well, it's called Smoke and Mirrors, so you can hazard That's a guess. That's our title. Smoke and Mirrors. It's all. It's all tricks. Tricks of the eye. Oh, deception. Look at his real. Is it or isn't it? The idea that reality isn't, isn't real. real. That there is no reality. Right? right. Okay. That's what we're on about. It's called. I just. I just learned this recently. Oh yes. It's called a cosmism. That's that's the oh. thesis that there is no cosmos, there's no reality, it's all an illusion. Yeah. As all these spoons. There is no spoon. Get it? Okay. But. That, hopefully, and is And that means you can drink as much wine as you want. <laughs> yeah. No. No ill effects. Do <clears throat> you want to tell us about this wine you brought for us tonight? All I can tell you is that it's a rather affordable uh, Argentinian Malbec, which has proved <laughs> quite popular in the past. Uh, this one is called Sol de Mendoza. And uh, uh, let's try it. I can open it because it doesn't even require yeah, a cork. Right. Right. Um, so, hmm, would you like a little glass of this? Matt? I'll have a taste. This is our first drop of wine, fictive wine, in a long time. Yeah. We've been quite... That's not where it'll go with that. It's been several months, I've just been drinking wine and not thinking at all. Yeah. (laughs) I'm not used to it. My thinking muscle is well depleted. Mm, Well, we'll see, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's really great to be doing this. It's been too long since we've had a thinkative. Absolutely. Uh, So I'm glad we're back. Mm, Glad we're back. Cheers. 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 Cheers, Jace. Cheers, Jim. Cheers, Jim. Cheers, cheers, Lowell. Cheers, all. Okay. Mm. Cheers, everybody. Who may or may not be out there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, oh, to the oh, yes. I mean, what well, Oh, and, and if anybody is out there watching, don't forget to go ahead and text in any questions. comments or questions. Oh, I'll, try and, I'll try and pick them up on the yeah. old oh, yeah, please. Uh, we'll mobile, mobile, mobile device. device. Um, Gavin, Gavin likes Thinkative's video, so hi, Gavin. Gavin. Hi, Gav. Hope hi, Gav. Hope you're feeling better. Yes, yes, here is okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, we ought to get down to it. Let yes. me, uh, <laughs> Distract. Let Let me just mention that the reason why I wanted to why I wanted to get onto this topic is because there was something in the news recently. Yeah, it was. That, that hopefully it. we'll get to maybe a little bit later. Maybe we'll go back into sort of the background a bit first. But there was this. Uh, article in the news recently. I saw uh, several different sites, actually websites, um, <laughs> that um, uh, that apparently physicists have proved that the universe can't possibly be a computer simulation. Right. right. This is this is what some of the articles. That's what they claim. That's, that's what they claim. So we'll talk about but that are they a little really? bit later. Yeah. Uh, exactly. and, and whether that's even conceivable or possible that you could prove something like that. Mm. Some people would just say, "No, you can't. You can't ever prove that." Right. I love the idea. Mm. Of an illusion that is so confident that it's prepared to disprove itself. Mm. Now that, that's good thinking because that makes me, you know, then that, that, that's quite an illusion. Yeah, of course. One of the, one of the first comments I saw on, on on this article was false flag, right? Which oh is, no. Yeah. Uh. Which uh, I didn't know what that meant either. Apparently, false flag is this sort of like uh, this general technique of just sort of throwing out false information to you know, sort of confuse your opponents, right? So the idea mm-hmm. is that it all is a huge conspiracy, and but somebody out there has planted these articles to prove that that uh, that it's not an illusion. Oh, really? Okay. Well, where do we go from there? What what fascinates me? Well, one is, uh, and I mean, you briefly mentioned this, and I'm dying to hear more. Is that this, we're all familiar with the idea of the matrix? Mm-hmm. Fantastic, you know, and, and, mm-hmm. a, and a great way, you know, going down the rabbit hole, which pill, you know, this is all the business. Great fun, yeah. yeah. yeah well, a, a, loads of fun. Great yeah. idea, lovely yeah, comic. Good. You know, I saw it. You know, it was a great comic ride, com- comic book ride. Um, but obviously, I never really. I thought, well, it's, it's a nice notion, but it's not something that I'd ever really take seriously. But apparently. Hundreds of years ago, people were positing the idea that 
what we see is not what we get. You know, what sure. we th where we think we are is not where we are. It goes along with that. Um, where, did, where, did it, where did it originate, this idea? Well, I doubt that there's any place, any specific place where it really originated. So the, the thing that, that people always talk about in connection with uh, The Matrix is Descartes, right? right. The idea of the evil genius. Um, so, but Descartes uses this idea that everything is an illusion as a way to, to systematically doubt everything that he can. This is part of his epistemological technique. This is how he's going to um, sort of deliver himself out of a life of question and doubt and into a life of certainty. His plan is to begin by doubting absolutely everything. So he goes through, he doesn't just say, okay, I don't believe this, I don't believe that. Rather, he gives arguments, gives reasons why we can't be uh, certain of anything that we see or hear or what have you, or read, certainly. Um, what kind of reasons did he... So the, the, the reason that relates to this, and this is sort of like the last step, right? Because he sort of builds up from, from more run-of-the-mill illusions to, uh, to you know, this radical doubt. Yeah. Um, and the radical doubt is, well, look, there could just be some uh, very clever person who is somehow tricking me into believing that, that uh, or some very clever being or demon or what have you, uh -huh. who's tricking me into believing that this is the real world and that everything that I'm seeing is real. <laughs> I mean, there are also arguments about, well, this could be a dream. How do you know you're not dreaming? Mm. Is it at all possible? And Descartes first argues, hey, that's problem. me. Uh -huh. Got a bit of feedback so I was there. just checking the uh, and, feed. Okay, are we good? Yeah, yeah. we're good. And, 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 and Descartes at first thinks, well, uh, he at first argues that we can never know whether or not we're dreaming. But then by the end of the meditations, he, he decides that he has, he's worked out a way mm. to, to, mm. to determine whether we're, mm -hmm. we're dreaming or not. But, okay, so there's Descartes, but what I wanted to say is that it goes back much further than that, even if you go back to, there's, I mean, it's a, Plato's cave is a very close related idea. All right, yeah. Right, so uh, you remember all about Plato's cave? Yeah. The idea of, you know, if you're sitting there in a cave, but all you've ever seen are the shadows of people from behind you, that is what you would take from for reality, when in fact the reality is much more deeper and interesting than that. Yeah, uh, that's right. And but but you've only got a narrow narrow vision of what reality is. That right, right. So you're seeing shadows of the, of the real world yeah. instead of the real world itself. Yeah. Right, and and so that's a very closely related idea because that's kind of the same thing that we're being told in 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 a film like The Matrix, right? It's not that there is no real world. It's not that this there's nothing real about their experience inside the Matrix, mm -hmm. but they're kind of manipulated shadows, only they're deliberately manipulated shadows. They're not just the shadows of people passing by, mm -hmm. but the shadows of, of some evil genius who's manipulating, mm -hmm. the, or, or the computer system, what have you, that's manipulating mm -hmm. human consciousness to believe what they believe. So you use this born out of an idea that it's, it's difficult for someone to accept reality. Because the, the thing that I'm curious about is... What would be the motivation for someone to do that to me? If I was, say, enslaved and uh, pumping life essence out into some other big machine or whatever and being used as, as some little coloured up baby in a box somewhere, if I was doing that, then why bother to, why bother to fool me? Yeah, I, I go. Well, what's I'm look. I'm really interested in the motivation for somebody trying to tr deceive deceive me like that. Because if you had that kind of power, why would you bother? Why not just keep me in total misery and awareness of what I was in? Is it because I won't generate? So and then you go. Oh well, that's because you won't generate the right kind of thought fuel energy. Or whatever. Yeah. yeah. But that's obviously just a very contrived device in the matrix, right? Yeah. They have to keep the people alive to serve as batteries. Which surely yeah. there's something better you can. Batteries. Yeah, do yourself and just and, one. <laughs> and if they don't keep them sort of happy and deluded that they're in, living in some real world, then it won't work right or whatever. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's convenient. Um, I think that I think the usual excuse given is science, right? See, always is, you always see these sort of science fiction scenarios with a brain in a vat, which yeah. is another thing that philosophers talk about a lot. Um, yeah. More that's more like the 20th century version of Descartes' evil genius, right? Yeah. The brain and the bat. Mm. It's a classic image. Mm. And you see this sort of thing in like 1950s science fiction movies. And yeah. it's always some scientist just screwing with the brain, you know, for purely scientific, experimental, possibly self-serving, demented reasons. Yeah, yeah. And now, 
We come today to to this thing called the simulation argument. Right. And and now the idea of the simulation argument is well the, the conclusion is that it's very likely that that all of this is a computer simulation, a computer simulated reality. Okay. Including you and you and you and me. Mm -hmm. Right? So the idea is that we're not real people being deluded by some sort of evil genius. We're just computer simulated people who think that they're real. Uh, okay. right? uh, so there's, a, there's an assumption there that, the, that the, the underlying basis of consciousness is irrelevant. Mm. Right? That consciousness could be implemented in, in, um, in just sort of computer chips mm. as, uh, just as uh, well as it could be in brains. Mm. Mm. All right. So, so we are just someone's something or someone's dream, some concoction. Yeah, or even nothing's dream. Just, just a, just a sort of, we're just a video game, basically. Just the way it turned out. But why would people do that? Why would people play my life? <laughs> 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 well, the guy who, the guy who uh, came up with the simulation argument, at least in its current form, I don't know if there are there are sort of ancestors to this argument. His idea is that, is that if we continue to evolve to some sort of like transhuman ability, mm -hmm. such that we have the ability to create these kinds of simulations rather easily, that we're probably going to be interested in simulating our own ancestors. And in a way that's kind of plausible because simulation is one of the ways that science is done today, right? right. So rather than, uh, rather than, you know, use instruments to look very closely at, at actual systems of subatomic particles, mm -hmm. we develop these computer simulations to, to try to tell us what at least, what are the th implications of the theory of subatomic particles and what that would look like. Okay. So simulations are used in scientists, science very much, and you could imagine maybe in the future, um, even anthropologists, will be simulating civilizations so that they can study them. Right. So we could be some anthropologists simulation yeah. of an um, early 20th century bunch of... But I guess we could also be some future alien kids game from a super advanced technology version of The Sims. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. right. I mean, just a, a game, just yeah, simulate a just world, a yeah, and see what turns out. And we turn that where, where somebody's game, somebody else has played a different game. These sorts of simulation games have been popular for a long time. So pretty much ever since computers uh, became, you know, uh, household, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Sort of like household objects, right? Yeah. Um, but of course, they started out really, really crude. And I've always found this really boring. Like, why would somebody? Mm. Sit there and just develop like Sim City, develop a simulated city, and just sort of watch it grow. And mm. yeah, it's sort of like gardening. Mm. But I don't know. But but then there are variations. I know. I know my daughter. She's only ten, um, and even when she was say like eight years old, she's fascinated with the Sims. Mm. Right. The idea of of just have, having these simulated people walk around and mm. playing with them. It's just a game. Yeah, but it's also a simplified version of life, isn't it? So it, it, when things feel complicated or whatever, I can understand that people kick back and like go, oh, I'm just going to make a new fridge and things like that. You know, and it's easy. It's, it's a really controllable environment, whereas life, re the reality of life, or what I perceive to be the reality of life, is quite chaotic and uncontrollable at times. Um, so I can see, I can see why it's a sort of re so. I mean, we may be just, uh, you know, a little, a little, uh, you know. Um, Pa pastime, yeah, a little something, a little chewing gum for the mind of some supreme superior being. Yeah, I mean, in a way, um, all the world's religions, or at least you know the major religions, have a similar problem. Why on earth would God create us? What 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 is the game? What's yeah. a, what's such a wonderful thing about creating us and watching us sort of scamper around and hit each other? Yeah, because if we are in a simulation, then that is our God, whoever create the program. Mm. Effectively, right? Yeah. That's basically it. He's our creator or, or he, she, it, whatever. Yeah. They. She. Laurel <laughs> <laughs> says she. Yeah. yeah. No, I can buy that. But I mean, yes, but again, what's what's curious is why, I, I suppose it's people questioning, yeah, obviously the idea comes from questioning your existence. 
and you're going, well, mm. what, what's it all about, Alfie? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Oh, <laughs> I, it could be like this. It could be an illusion. I could be a plaything. I could be a pawn in mm -hmm. some, you know, cosmic chess game. I've got no understanding of. But I, yeah, I still, I mean, I was interested when I when I read that bit of information. I didn't read it very. I just went, oh, good. Oh, that's a relief. <laughs> yeah. you know the, the story that that's says the we story can't be that says we can't be. I go, oh, that, that that's a relief. Not that I was like it was playing on my mind, but it was like, oh, good. Yeah, because that makes sense. It would be impossible. But then it's only. But if it, that, 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 as I was saying, if it is a simulation and it's and it's doubting itself. Uh, and saying that actually the light it is impossible, then it's a great cover story, isn't it? Because we just carry on, uh, you know, taking the bullet and, and living the life that is a purely imaginative exist imaginative existence for somebody else. Yeah, you can do anything you want then, right? Yeah, but he also, I mean, that's the problem is that if you get into that way of thinking, it opens up a lot of dangerous avenues because it thinks that it, it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter now if I tore your glasses off and stamped on them and pulled your nose and. But it does matter yeah, within. Jason. It does matter within the rules of our simulation. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our conditions that have been set out. Yeah. To to play the game. Yeah. I'll be transgressing. Yeah. But sure. isn't that a great way to test it? What? what was, what's the test? Well, no, because you'd still be in the game. Oh, it's I'd be still no the penalties of the game. Yeah. You would. You would know. Yeah. By transgressing the so rules. So we have to behave. Perhaps the only way to. To really test it is to find I was thought if we actually did find out if we are in a simulation or not. Yeah. Is that like the end game? Would then they say, Okay, that's it. Yeah. We'll switch the game off. Like being to the big, <laughs> the yeah. big yeah, boss. But if they switch yeah. the game off, you'll never know they switch the game no, off. You'll just be no. gone. There's yeah. no There'll winning be a new that. game. There's no I mean it's a metaphor for existence in a way, because we've got no way of knowing what's directing us or what what it'll throw out next. I mean, it really is just another way of thinking about existence. It's kind of a, in a way, it's kind of a modern anti-religious religion. It's a way of saying, oh, well, even though we no longer believe that God created the earth, or even, um, or even you know, uh, the galaxy or what have you, um, we can still, even, if we, even though we don't believe in God in the, in the classical sense, so to speak, mm. we can still sort of slough off our responsibility mm. on some other higher being by arguing that we're all living in a computer simulation. Yeah, exactly. He passes the book. But I don't think that's always been the motivation for it, right? Right. Um, so we can, we can look in the, in, in the literature and, and, and religions and see what the, the arguments are, right? And, and we know that Plato used this idea, and I wouldn't say that his is a pure acosmism, I'd say that, that Plato is really trying to tell us that, that the world may be very different from how it seems, rather than telling us that it's, none of it's real. Right. But nonetheless, yes. it, it's a very similar idea, and what he's, what he's doing is trying to make a point that, that there's a deeper reality than appearances. That's, that's essentially the point, right? Right. Um, and that we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be so quick to accept the things that we think we see in, in the world, right? We should question. I mean, yeah, I think if it's if it's a way of nudging us towards the idea of always questioning things, and, and never it, taking anything for granted, that's a healthy thing. And of course, Plato had a more specific point, which is that for him, there's this more there's this more perfect world, the world of ideals, right? And and the things that we see here in our world are just sort of rough shadows, sort of like you know, shadows is the metaphor that he uses, but it's almost as if they're sort of like child's child's scribbles of a dog rather than a real dog, right? right. So, so we have, still have this idea in geometry, right? A, a, a triangle is this very perfect object mm -hmm. that's never instantiated. The thing you draw on your paper mm -hmm. uh, in school or what have you is just a rough sort of image of a, of a quasi-triangle. Mm -hmm. Real triangles are something that only exists in this perfect world of Plato's that's mm -hmm. sort of back there behind us that we can only see shadows of. Right. So he's trying to, he's using this whole sense, idea of illusion to say that there's something better, there's something higher for us to attain to, right? The ideal of the good, mm. for example, which is, I think, the main point of it in the context of the Republic. Mm. But now Descartes, he has a slightly different motivation, but there's still this sort of don't take everything you see for granted element to it, mm. right? He is trying to convince himself that, that we don't have clear reasons to believe anything that we believe. So, let's start over. Let's start from the bottom. Mm. Let's start with, let's find something that we cannot doubt, 
and then try to build back up from there. Mm. And uh, what, what, what kind of things can we ever be sure of? Well, you know, we've talked about this before. So Descartes' idea was we can be sure that, that there's a thinking being. Because I can't even doubt that, right? If, mm. I, were to, if, I, if I doubt that, then, then I'm thinking, and therefore there is a thinking being. Mm. Mm. Uh, and, of course, there's, there have been lots of counter-arguments to that. One being just that just even, even if we accept that there is thinking occurring, that doesn't imply that there is a thinker. Mm. Uh, right, and, yeah. But I don't want to do another whole episode on Descartes. <laughs> no, no, no. But it's nice to be refreshed about these things. Um, uh, and then you know, I think that like the Matrix, and there's also there's also this book that I think I mentioned to you the other day um, that was very popular in the '70s called Illusions by a guy called Richard Bach. Right. Okay. This book, Illusions, is about a, a reluctant messiah, a guy who has become a messiah, but is quitting his messiah job just so he can fly airplanes, fly little biplanes around, oh, um, and, uh, and he becomes a sort of teacher to the, the, the protagonist of the book. Um, and what he teaches them is that the world is an illusion, and as a consequence, you can, you can manipulate it a little bit if you, if you try, if you learn how. So, you can, so I remember, because I read this when I was a little kid, but mm -hmm. I remember, I remember uh, the protagonist of the book um, sort of look, he would practice looking up into the clouds and trying to make clouds disappear, right, just mentally. Right. So that's sort of, and you see this in the Matrix as well, right? Yeah. You see this idea that, oh, if the world is an illusion, then we can sort of, control we can control it somehow, mm. right? We could somehow, uh, dodge bullets, it's like, dodge oh, bullets, uh, make walls, mm, these things ripple, cross building, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are people also who, who think, well, obviously, you know, think not everybody within, say this, this simulation exists, right, and we, we are able, in some way, some people do have the ability to move objects, you know, at will, or communicate with people who've passed away. They're, that's what they think. Yeah. Which is contradictory to what I think, for example, you know, they think that can't happen. Uh, but there are people who believe that. So they have a different belief system within this same thing. So are they still playing the, you know, this game, this, the, 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 the rules of this game are much broader than any individual. There's no individual here who carries all the beliefs of everybody in the world. Everybody's got a slightly different spin on what reality is and what your pulse is and what your controllability is. I mean, I would imagine most people don't believe they can move things with their mind. But there are people who you know, would, would claim, would Yuri believe Gilly. that they could bend a spoon. Obviously, mm -hmm. Yuri Geller was a catastrophe for and was, you know, was using trick spoons and all that and bending them when he was talking, you know, and that's, that's the way it was. And, you know, he took people in and people believed his reality. But it means that, that we are only, if it is one big illusion, and I'm just running with it really and landing off, then we are all carrying different fragments of that, of that complete picture. Well, maybe we're all just sort of misinterpreting the, the, the reality that's been constructed for us. Right? It doesn't have to be any different from... Yeah, that, doesn't, that seems to be the case whether, whether the universe is real or not. Right? We're all sort of interpreting it somewhat differently. Yeah. Yeah. So it's quite an open game. It's quite an open world game, then, this, this, uh, this simulation. Well, let's talk a little bit about how the argument goes. What's the argument that this is a simulation, right? So there's this guy, Nick Bostrom. He published this paper in 2003. He's a philosopher at Oxford, I think. Um, and the argument sort of goes like this. Uh, well, I, I kind of ran down the argument already, but it's basically, look, if, if people develop um, to the point that, uh, that they'll be able to simulate worlds like this, and it seems likely that we will, because just the way in which our ability to create simulations, computer simulations, has been growing massively. Mm. So, if um, if there are, uh, if the human species is likely to develop that far, and if they're likely to be interested in creating simulations, yeah. then they're going to create a lot of them, and so. Since there are going to be many more simulated worlds than there are base real worlds, yeah. so the argument goes, yeah. um, then it's just much, much more likely that we're in a simulated world rather than in a real one. 
Oh right, yeah. The ops. Just by just yeah. by, just by numbers, the numbers. Yeah. Right? numbers. Yeah. Uh, so that's the argument. Yeah. That's the basic argument. And um, now there's a there, there's a fellow at the LSE, um, uh, Jonathan Burke, right? Uh, he had a response paper to this, and his argument is that well, look. Um, when Bostrom makes this argument, he is assuming a lot he's, uh, about what sort of computation is possible in the world. Right? Mm -hmm. So he's assuming we have good evidence about that. Mm -hmm. But Bostrom is also assuming that we don't have good evidence for things like I have real physical hands, two real physical hands. Mm -hmm. Okay. We so don't have good evidence. That we do not, right? Because if we have good evidence that I have real physical hands, then we have good evidence that the world is real. Ah, physical hands, right. right? Yeah, I get you. So, so, uh, so Birch thinks that there's a contradiction there, or at least a kind of, uh, a kind of incongruity, right? Mm. That we have, we have very good evidence about what sort of computational power is possible within this, within this world, but we have very bad evidence that there's even a real world. And that seems like the tension that needs to be resolved, according to John Birch. I see. So, there, so actually, yeah, because we are assuming that there is a real world in order for the illusion to be created. Yeah, right. I mean, right. That, that's the assumption that's being made, because there is no illusion created without some sort of like physical foundation right. from which the illusion could be projected. So, in a sense, it's not complete acosmism, right? Because it's... Because there still has to be... It's monocosmism. Yeah, yeah. It, or it's... What is it then? It's like, there is a real world, but this ain't it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and really, it, it's been argued that all of these sort of anti-realist views yeah. are, at bottom, realist views, because they all assume that there's a real difference between the... Uh, between an illusionary, an, an illusionary world and, and the real ones, yeah. right? So now they don't all necessarily assume that there is a that there's an illusion is, but even to draw the distinction between this universe being real and being not real assumes that there's a fact of the matter about that. Yeah. And a lot of uh, anti-realists uh, in the 20th century and today would say, hmm. well, that's where they're making a mistake. You have to be um, there. There isn't really even a coherent way of thinking about uh, whether the world is real or not. In fact, this was the argument that. Hillary Putnam made against Brains and Avat. Mm -hmm. We talked about Hillary Putnam before too. He we comes have, up a yeah. Lot. Yeah, he, with his stuff about uh, special relativity and uh, and the block universe, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. So, but Hillary Putnam's argument on See, think it is uh, three, four. Yeah, yeah. Seven. Look for our one on <laughs> yeah. space, time, and motion. Um, so the thing Hillary Putnam says about this is, oh look, we can't even say that this world is an illusion. We can't even say that, um, that uh, for example, this book or my hand isn't real. If, if the whole world is not real, then you can't even say that. The reason is that, that Putnam, like, um, like uh, Saul Kripke, has this idea about meaning, right? This mm -hmm. idea about how words refer. And the idea is that in order to refer to a thing like that camera, there has to be, in order for my words to refer to that camera, there has to be some kind of a causal connection mm -hmm. between the camera and my words. Right? Mm -hmm. So, if I say that uh, that I'm a brain in a vat, then I, I'm referring to a brain and a vat, or at least I'm claiming to. But mm -hmm. in actuality, my, my concept of a brain, my concept of a vat, Mm. are both referring to illusions that are generated by some kind of electronic stimuli that are coming in through wires. Yeah. Right? So in other words, if I really am a brain in a vat, then I can't refer to actual brains and actual vats, and I can only refer to simulated brains and vats that, that, I'm, that I have experience with. Right, yeah. So, and then Putnam concludes that, consequently, it's, it's metaphysically impossible, or if you like, logically impossible, for me to be a brain in a vat, because I can't even express that. Right? Hmm. For when I say I'm a brain in a vat, it means you only think you're a brain in a vat. Yeah. Well, it means something like it means something like uh, I am a uh, I am a computer simulation of a brain in a computer simulation of a vat. I am a 
a collection of electrical signals that is related in a certain way to another collection of electrical signals. And so I've tried to say that I'm actually a physical brain in a physical vat, mm. and I've failed. Instead, I'm saying I'm a collection of electrical signals uh, related to another collection of electrical signals. Mm. So this is, this, is, <laughs> this is Putnam's argument against being a brain in a vat. We can't even You're say You're more than that, Matt. You're much more oh. than that. But that's the thing, you know, but that's, that's interesting. So he's putting a different spin on it. But, but what, just going back to, you know, that, 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 that idea of whether or not there's a founding reality upon yeah. which all this illusion is based. Um, is it just, you know, I mean, we could be puppets of a consciousness, you know, that, that it just exists um, and is imagining, you know, and just, but it's just so good at imagining that it's yeah. tricked us into thinking that things are solid and, you know, uh, there's all this stuff. The thing about it is, what's interesting is whenever you create these, there's lots in the world I don't understand. And you know, struggle to understand, and, and and are learning on a daily basis. We're all learning this stuff, or and then forgetting stuff. And blah, blah, blah. so there's much more. There's always much more than you're aware of. You'd think, in a way, if you were living in some sort of fabricated consciousness, there wouldn't be too much. There's always outside your grasp, outside your like mental grasp, physical grasp, physical ability. You know, I can't, I can't run a marathon. I but I, and I and I don't know. You know. The, the, the whole of pie, and I, I, you know, I can't, you know, there are Shakespeare plays I've never read. So it's the idea, what would be the point of populating the world with all that kind of stuff that you can't even understand if the whole world is just generated in order to sort of yeah. deceive you into thinking it's real? Well, so then, 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 then that will, then that, con I mean, the thing is, it's so, it's so endlessly complex. I suppose you can imagine that some vast intelligence might get a kick out of, out of seeing someone struggle to understand, you know, that struggle to understand something. Well, they might not be... Like doing magic tricks well, on dogs. They might not be kind of... Yeah, like doing those, magic tricks on dogs. It's exactly. like individuals. Sorry, just such. What, what we do and what we think, they might not be aware of or even conceive. Yeah. We might just be the outcome of an initial set of conditions to test... You, you, right. you know, they've, oh, they've yeah. kind of run a simulation yeah. of like what happens, say, at the Big Bang. Sure. Yeah. And they've just run it. They've just run it just run forwards. Maybe they keep and, making and, another and and the, trying to make and, another and Einstein. It's like, you know, if you think about the multiverse, we're just one set of outcomes. Yeah. And they, so they, they kind of run this simulation to sort of test the initial conditions. Yeah. Right. And they just keep running it. And we're one of the outcomes. Yeah. And right. it's not like it's a game in which they're looking at all our thoughts and our. We're, we're, we're just what happened. Mm. We're, we're, they put these conditions in, and we're what came out. And this would explain why why they're not messing with us too much, right? Why they, they, they just they just got a shelf somewhere in a petri dish. And just yeah, you know, and they can't they can't tamper stuff. with the experiment, or that would that would that would you know that yeah. would soil the experiment. Yeah. Right. Then you'd have invalid results. You've got to leave it alone. Yeah. See if life develops and see how long it takes them to blow themselves up. Yeah. So we're just like a, a sort of petri dish. Yeah. Basically, to see what comes mm. out, and and that's why it's chaotic, and because mm. we're just yeah. a, you know we're just one of billions of and possible you know, outcomes. One 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 thing that you can say in favor of this is that it's more plausible. It, it's a little more explicable. Than, um, than a God creating this world, right? Because uh, if, if God means omnipotent, omniscient, and, and perfectly good, uh, then why would you bother, right? Uh, whereas if you're just a scientist, and, and also why would, you, why would God never help us, right? Mm. If, if we're created by an omniscient and benevolent God, why doesn't he give us a little help once in a while, mm. right? Yeah, yeah. We never see him do nothing around here. <laughs> But if there are scientists that just want to see what happens for scientific reasons, mm. then you know, then they can't mess with it, mm. and it makes sense, right? Mm. It makes sense that they just leave it alone, mm. and it makes sense that they would create us just to sort of, you know, for scientific reasons to yeah. see what happens. Yeah. But okay. Uh, oh, hey, Jace. Any any comments or questions or anything? That's how I did a little look a while ago. I hope it's not no. Um, let's, have a, let's have a look. Oh, there are dozens of comments. <laughs> um, uh, well, In my mind. At Sab <laughs> CJ likes the negative video. Oh, ah, that's that? yes. I won't say I won't say her name out loud. Okay. All oh, right. Uh, friend, yeah. good friend of ours. Well, afraid right. is, is a bit like no, Candyman Cat. Yeah. No, but there's a reason why she doesn't <laughs> use her real name. Oh, that's not a real name. I see. 
So this is our right. So it's a made up name. Well, let's have another. Let's okay. have a top up while we while we distract him. Hand me Jace's glass. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Jace right. isn't driving tonight for once. Yeah. Yes, so I could have two glasses. Yeah. What else we got there, Jace? Uh, nothing, nothing yet. But if you do have any questions, you know, and you're watching, yeah, well, drop us a line and we'll endeavour to uh, answer what is the nature of uh, I'm sure reality. I'm sure just engrossed and he's just waiting for us to, you know, yeah, hanging on our every gem. So the the thing that uh, that I think is an interesting question here is. Is it even possible to ever know whether you're in a computer simulation or not? How would you be able to tell? Mm. Points. Any points you've got from that. Uh, well, you couldn't. You couldn't? Ah, oh. really? Are you sure? Well, if it's that brilliant a simulation. Mm. Yeah, okay, but maybe there would be limitations to how brilliant it can be. Yeah. Right. So you've got to assume sense. that that even even if you know even if we get much much better at, at producing simulations or some other some other race of creatures gets much much better than we are at creating simulations, mm -hmm. there's still going to be uh, resource constraints, right? Yeah. So you might expect that you might expect that that if you sort of dig deep enough, you'll sort of find the the the, the nuts and bolts of it. Yeah. Right? Well, I thought maybe something like. The reason why we can't find a grand unified theory for everything is because we're kind of built from the ground up from this simulation. And, but they didn't go far enough into the nuts and bolts of creating the simulation to make gra you know, gravity and the quantum physics. Oh, that'll do. But they don't, the reason they don't kind of match together, we can't find you know, a, a, a kind of theory that matches from the very small but the very, very big is that when they kind of created the program, they didn't go into the very tiniest detail. And we've got to those details yet. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and we can't kind of, they don't reconcile, and perhaps they don't reconcile because the problem with the they're coding. not actually real. They're just a bit of coding. Uh -huh. And there's a problem, they weren't quite coded correctly. They just thought, yeah, we've got gravity, we've got quantum physics. Yeah, that'll be enough. That'll, that'll do. That'll do, yeah. yeah that'll do. We, we've worked out the small stuff. We've got this team working on like the big shape of it, yeah, yeah. and then this other team is working on the little, little bits and stuff. pieces. And they yeah. don't quite match. <laughs> yeah, and but nobody will really notice. Put it out really anyway. anyway. Yeah, yeah well, well, the simulation. The beta. We're just in a beta. Point, yeah. Is what it yeah. is. You know, so that's interesting. So, so then our failure to understand the the physics of our world is evidence that that it sort of puts together sort, sort of shoddy. Made up, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a shoddy world. Well, yeah. that's that's interesting. I've actually seen so. Someone has suggested that, look, um, you know, there's got to be sort of a minimal resolution. You can't represent perfect continuity with finite resources. So, uh, so everything would have to be quite discrete, right? At some level, if you if you dig down deep enough, you'll find sort of the pixels of the universe. And then someone suggested, well, look, if you if if you um, are if we're receiving light from a distant enough source, then we should see some sort of like anomalies. Um, the, in the sort of like uh, the digitization of, of the light that we're looking at, mm. or something like mm. that. But we assume also that it is digital. I mean, that's because right. we understand we've got digital in our this existence, but it could be something far better. Some kind than that. of a purely analog simulation. Yeah. yeah. Or, or does something beyond digital? Does something? Or, or that may, well, not just zeros and ones. They might have. Yeah. More than that. Another number, yeah. <laughs> well, we have more than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but we can but only not, do. We can only really code things on and off. Binary. Yeah, but maybe they, maybe it's not well, binary. They, presumably they have quantum computers, which could be both zeros yeah. and ones. They'd have far more powerful processing to yeah. create these incredible simulations. Right. Yeah. It's a very good point. Yeah, because I think yeah, because you if you if you had that kind of level of skill, you'd make damn sure that it couldn't be found out, wouldn't you? That, you know. You'd be very careful about exposing flaws in the uh, system. Well, yeah, maybe, but maybe you don't really expect the, the, the subjects to get this far. Maybe this is we're at sort of the, the Voyager stage where it's like, well, okay, we've seen Jupiter mm. and it's still carrying on out there. Mm. We don't really care about the experiment that much anymore, mm. but let's watch and see. There's a couple happens. of scientists looking down a microscope now, just <laughs> yeah. like looking really anxiously at one another. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they always got it. <laughs> well, you know, if we did find out, what are we going to do? Yeah. We're going to say, hey! <laughs> <laughs> what what were they gonna say? <laughs> Turn us off. Good uh, game, good yeah. game. Yeah, make us real. What are you? Yeah, yeah. Hey, you guys. Uh, well, there's a question. What, what, yeah. Send more wine. The question. Oh. oh. Well, we do feel real. 
I mean, you know, I definitely feel real to the point that, oh, you know, this feels very, you know, this is fun to talk about, but it's 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 uh, something very definitely hypothetical because of the detail. I mean, yes, we're uh, all right. So I'm just some sort of strand of an experiment of which there are other, you know, many billions of other strands of experiment. Uh, and it's not, you know, great swathes of my life aren't particularly interesting or, you know, or painful yeah. or whatever. <laughs> it's just like, it's just like a bit of grass waving in the wind, really. Mm. Uh, and it's, it just seems, uh, you know, it, but what's happening to me feels, you know, very real. I'm lucky enough not to be, you know, live my life in pain or have, you know, many issues. That could happen at any time, like it could happen at any time to any of us so there's that sort of uh, the, the the sense of being human i think is is a very powerful one and have it been a consciousness housed within this body uh you know with relationships that i have is very very solid uh so although it's nice to think about this it's, i think about it in the same way as i think you know it'd be the discussion about heaven or something like that which is obviously something that i don't believe in sure or, or hell. I don't think any of us are, are particularly convinced by this idea. That, no. That this is a. But it's an, in, an interesting one. It just, but it just bring, brings me back to, to what it is in, in the same way as, as you know as, as people get um, drawn into conspiracy theories and things like that. What it is that creates this notion? Because I suppose, like we were saying, right, Plato. Right. It's, it's about that idea. Is it about the idea of? of of how I mean, I think it's use. It has its uses because it makes you go, don't take everything, anything for granted, yeah. and question everything. Yeah, it's and good. It's good to be. It's, it's a healthy questioning thought experiment from from my perspective. This, I think. And I think there's also that the, there's an aspect of it. There's a motiv another motivation that that seems to come up when this is associated with Eastern religions. Uh, and there's the, from what I've seen, there's some debate about whether. There's really any particular Eastern religion that that, that espouses that the that reality is an illusion, mm -hmm. um, but uh, there's there's a version of, of of Hinduism that's quite close to it. I think it's called the Vedanta Hinduism, and uh, and and in the Matrix it seems to be associated with Buddhism, and also I think in mm. things like illusions uh, they're they're referencing some kind of Buddhism. Mm. But the the idea there I think is something like. Well, it, it allows you to transcend the, the bullshit of everyday life, mm. right? It allows you to sort of raise, raise yourself a little above it and say, yeah, the, 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 the dogs bark and mm. the caravan passes. Mm. And I just sit here and, and, you know, do my needlepoint or whatever is your thing. Yeah. And, there, you know, and the Matrix isn't the only example. I mean, I'm just thinking about they live now. You know, the... Uh, John Carpenter. Is it, is it John they Carpenter? live. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's a slightly different kind of. But it's, it's, it's still so positive. Living. It's the fact that we're living that, that we're being fooled by uh, you know evil uh, evil force who are basically forcing us to consume and you know and live. What ha have, you, have you seen that film? Yeah. It's a good film. Right. Should watch it. Yeah. It, well, it, because live. it's about okay. discovering this this guy who discovers these glasses. When he puts these glasses on, suddenly Howdy Waddy Piper. The, rest the veil of, yeah. is lifted, mm. and you know all the advertising hoardings are, are stripped down to one word. Like, he has these okay. good sunglasses, <laughs> and when he puts them on, yeah, he sees the truth. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> it's, it's, a great, it's a great allegory, in the same, yeah. but it's, it's a very basic, low budget yeah. allegory for you yeah. know the yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Which is yeah. a good thing. Barry, yeah, Wait, yeah. the world is actually much blurrier than I thought it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, but here's another idea that occurred to me, right? Mm. There are two things, there are two aspects of our world that, that are very suggestive. Okay, so, um, so two, two things about computer simulations. One is um, the ones we have now, they're discrete, they're, they're sort of. They're, they're built up out of discrete information. They're pixelated in some sense, uh -huh. right? And the other is that a lot of these simulations today, they don't create everything. They don't create a whole universe, right? Because that's too expensive. What they do is, as you sort of move through the simulated world, they create it when you get there, oh, right? Yeah. Right. So it's like, uh, for example, in in Minecraft, mm. as you sort of you can see the computer sort of building the the world as you as you travel further and further. Out. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, in reality, we've discovered that the energy levels of the electron are discrete, 
mm -hmm. right? And that uh, that there's this there's this uh, sort of smallest unit called the the Planck length beyond which we can't measure things accurately, right? So there's this discretization in our own in our own world. Now, of course, people will point out that that quantum mechanics doesn't just say that everything is discrete, right? Mm -hmm. That's not what it says. And there is this this very complex continuous thing called the wave function, mm -hmm. which on some interpretation of quantum mechanics. That's all there is. There's just the wave function, mm. and the the discrete um, values that we get when we do measurements are just a kind of outgrowth of or, or a consequence of something called decoherence. Okay, so fine. But still, basically, it, uh, on some level, what quantum mechanics tells us is that things are a lot more discrete than you would have thought, and some people still still entertain the idea that everything in the universe, space and time, are also discrete, that there are, that there are individual points of space-time uh, rather than a continuous space. That we it's have. only there unless you look. Well, now then there's, the, yeah, there's also that aspect about quantum mechanics, right? We know, I, I would argue, that we know quite well that the, the outcomes of quantum measurements are not, are not predetermined. They are determined when we do the measurement. Mm. So it's quite like walking around in Minecraft, right? Mm. There's no, this, the, the electron... Called? Not seeded, when the world is happening. It's called something like seeded. Seeded oh. might be it. I know they use seeds in Minecraft, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I can't remember. I, I, I know what you're saying. There's, I can't a, there's a the term, term for it. Yeah. Anybody out there know the term for that? When they generate the simulated world as you're moving through it? Minecraft. Yeah. Some of the kids will have known it. Yeah, so... Um, <laughs> Right, so it's like that, right? This, the electron doesn't have a spin up or a spin down. You measure it, and then it says, "Oh, okay, yeah. I'll be spin up." Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm, it looks like a computer simulation to me. Yeah. And maybe that's why we have a, like a limit to the speed of light. It's it's the speed uh, beyond which they can't generate. If you go faster than that, they can't generate a simulation the, the fast image. Yeah, yeah. So that's the, that's the speed limit of the universe, is the speed at which they can create the world as we move through it's it. It's a massive undertaking, though. I mean, it is. Yeah, but we say that because we we're, we're might just be like insignificant, like tiny gnats compared to this vast super intelligence. Yeah, yeah. You know, we can't comprehend the intelligence that could create this, but maybe there is an intelligent that smart. Ah, yeah. so that's, now that's the argument that is based on this recent, um, scientific point, right? So the argument is basically that it would be too hard to mm. simulate our world. It would be computationally impossible. Mm. Okay, now, how does that go? Well, actually, if you go in and read the, read the article, it doesn't say that at all, right? Um, but, okay, so but what, what commentators on the article have said, people who are sort of like promoting this on the internet um, and saying that it proves that we don't live in a simulation, or maybe, Mm. What they're saying is that this article proves that certain processes in our world, so for example, like quantum many body problems, just just sort of figuring out um, like the the how uh, a collection of electrons will behave, mm. right? larger than say a thousand electrons, because we can we can do pretty good simulations of you know a thousand electrons, and and uh, this article in particular talks about when gravitational effects come into it, it becomes computationally intractable. So the argument is that there, that we can prove mathematically that it would be impossible for a computer smaller than our entire universe to simulate something like the interaction of a handful of electrons. Okay. Right? Now that's really interesting because that kind of thing might, that kind of a proof might be possible. This article, let me just say what the article is called, uh, in case anybody wants to look at it. Um, it's called Quantized Gravitational Responses, The Sign Problem, <laughs> and Quantum Complexity. And it's by a guy called Ringle, guys called Ringle and Gravitation. We'll post it. We'll post, yeah, we'll post the link. On the yeah. And basically what they're saying is there's this specific technique for, for simulating quantum systems. It's called a Quantum Monte Carlo uh, Method. Okay. Right. All right. And and it's a, it's not a quantum computing method though. It's a classical algorithm. And what it basically consists in is um, is using sort of random sampling to figure out integrals instead of calculating them explicitly. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, so integrals, you, you might know from, from like university, the, the main thing, you, you, the, 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 first, the, first, <laughs> the first thing you learn about integrals, right, the first thing you learn about integrals is that they're, they're the area under a curve, okay, so you've got this sort of curve that's determined by some formula, you want to know the area between that curve and, and, and the x-axis. A straight line, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so it can it's be really, really, really hard to calculate that. But one thing you can do is just draw the curve and then and, and draw the line at the bottom and then throw darts at it for a while yeah. and count how many darts fell under the curve. And then you've got an approximation for the area under the curve. Okay. Right? So that's called the Monte Carlo method. Right. So the idea is you can do, use similar methods like that to, to, to simulate quantum systems that would be much, much more difficult uh, to compute the behavior of. So you're saying that you don't need a, uh, a computer bigger than the universe to do it? No, that's you not what I'm saying. You just need a lot of darts. What I'm saying is, these guys in their article, they said, ah, but there are some things that quantum Monte Carlo methods won't work on. All right? Okay. And they're saying, they're saying, ah, and it's specifically tied with gravity. So, and, and of course, they can't really say all Monte Carlo methods, because that's a vague notion. But certain Monte Carlo methods Mm -hmm. won't work on certain problems in quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And that's all they've shown, right? So that really doesn't tell us that there's no way nah. to resolve these. I don't know, maybe the problems they're talking about would be more efficiently computed yeah. by a quantum algorithm with mm -hmm. quantum computers. We don't really know that. They haven't addressed that. No, and I mean, every, we all know technology just gets smaller and smaller, don't we? So. Yeah, and more and more powerful all the time. All the time. That's true, but what I think is an interesting I, question yeah. is, is it at least conceivable that we could give some kind of a theoretical computer science argument to the effect that, that simulating a world like ours would be impossible? Right. I don't think this is it, but I think it's an intriguing idea that maybe we could argue that, that, that some of the things that happen in our world are so complex it mm. would be impossible to simulate them. But then that is still predicated on the technology that we're aware of now. Because, you know, Descartes would say, oh, there's no way that, you know, that, or, or Babbage or whatever, you know, yeah. there's no way, you know, that this machine could ever get big enough to do that kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. But we're stuck in, we think digital is it. You yeah. Know? And, it's, and it's not. It's, there's going to be something else. I mean, is there, is there, are we, are we up against a finite wall? Is it like nothing travels faster than the speed of light? Digital is as, as good as it gets in terms of, like, a computing system? Or yeah. is someone going to have a breakthrough that could mean I could do it on the, something the size of my fingernail, could recreate everything that's ever been done in the history of the world ever? Well, I think that's an interesting question. I think it's a very interesting question, especially because, like what Jonathan Birch says, is that, is that the, the simulation argument, the, the claim that we can do a lot, that we would be able to simulate a whole world, mm -hmm. is based on a lot of knowledge about the physical world that, that we don't have if we're living in a simulation. Right, that's Jonathan yes. Birch's argument. Yeah. And the problem with that is, actually, most of our arguments in computer science are quite abstract and mathematical. They don't really depend on anything specific about the implementation of our world. Right? Yeah. They're just, they're, they're basically logical arguments. So, for example, Alan Turing, big hero of this country, right? Mm -hmm. And big hero of mine, absolutely. Yeah. Alan Turing, when he wrote his his seminal paper on computability and non-computability, mm. he didn't talk about what kinds of things our machines can do with our physics. What he did is he did an analysis of what computation is, right? And, and he was thinking more in terms of the model of a person with a pencil and paper, but it generalizes more than that. It's what is the idea of a recipe that, that, that produces an outcome? and what kinds of things are possible within that concept of a recipe and what kinds of things are not. Mm. And it turns out that using little tricks like turning the computer program on itself, you can prove all kinds of things about uh. what those recipes can and cannot do. Yeah. And it doesn't depend on the construction of the universe, doesn't depend on the physical implementation. It just depends on what is the idea of computation and then what happens when you turn it on itself. Mm. So maybe, maybe there's some kind of argument, but then at the same time, now we've got quantum computing, which doesn't 
do anything we couldn't do before, mm. but for some problems it does it faster. Mm. And maybe we're thinking wrong about the idea of a simulation, being that everything in the simulation, because the world is so complex, the computers were in everything about a simulation, whereas the simulation itself could be, you know, recently they've taught a computer to win at Go, yeah. and they taught it to win at Go, not by teaching it the rules of Go, they just got it to play itself and keep getting better. Right. Ah, uh, right. Okay, so maybe the simulation was the kind of creating the original program mm. and, and then just letting it go to see how complex it got. Mm. So, yeah. So it was a much simpler set of initial conditions and, and what happened, well, the chaos and complexity is one of any number of possible outcomes you know, because like when you play Go, there are billions of possible combinations to mm. play the game. Mm. So where, when you set the initial state of the game, you let it run, and and, and all the all the complexness comes out of the initial. That's you know. right. It's bottom up computing. It's, yeah. So uh, a, a computer simulation wouldn't necessarily have to compute the motion or the of a of a quantum many body system. It just, just has to, the rules. It just follows the rules, yeah. and, right? That it just puts in these sort of uh, representatives of electrons, and they just do what they do. And you don't have to solve the equation; you just let it go, right? Um, yeah, I think I think that's another important sort of caveat to these sorts of arguments, right? Mm. Because, uh, yeah, it doesn't. We don't have to explicitly calculate everything, mm. just sort of set it off. And after all, anything that our world actually does, presumably some machine could also do. Mm. As long as it's exactly as big and complex as our world is. Mm. Yeah, there's still that, you know, but there forever will be that issue of just this you know the consciousness because you know I'm I'm having a there's a damn good illusion of consciousness going on in my mind right at any rate you know what I mean there's a damn good illusion that I think therefore I am you know going back to Descartes that that yeah definitely that sense of, of that happening and and you know and, and this notion and, and again but what's interesting is you know as we've talked about this I've gone from you know, it's it's nice this argument to think about because it's, uh, it it keeps you questioning. For me, it just keeps you questioning what it, what is reality and, and what you are doing here. But I I don't I I'm very reticent always to go back to this idea of this other consciousness as this puppet master sense you know or this godlike sense yeah. behind what we're doing. You know I like the idea of. Of a, of, a, of a sort of random experiment left on a shelf in a petri dish. I like, I, you know, I can get into that much more, given the experience of the chaotic nature of life uh, and the sense that there is nothing, you know, there is there is no rhyme or reason behind what happens. We just happen to be here and we happen to be, uh, luckily, enjoying the luxury of being able to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. Well, quick question, because uh, we should wrap it up soon, mm -hmm. and the wine is almost gone. Oh, oh, no, oh, I've seen it. 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 i have that's that's that is just you know I would much rather feel that than feel that there's something somebody somewhere pulling a string or or, or, or giving me a you know giving me a bum hand and because I think ultimately when something you know you, you I don't want I don't want I don't like the idea of some external force being responsible. So it's the autonomy of it. It's the it's autonomy the of reality that, that, that makes it that makes it better. Yeah, that. rotten though and you know and, and magical that it can be, you know, and all <laughs> this all these multifacets. I would much rather it be, you know, here and now and uh, and very much what what you see is what you get. I'm like a WYSIWYG universe. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Perfect.
All right, well, with that, okay. I guess we should kill the bottle. All right, All right so there we go. Cheers. 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 Wow. Nice. That cheese. tastes real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. These spoons feel realer than they did before. These trees feel real. Mm. How about that hot? It's, uh, it sounds real. Okay. One, two, three. Mm.